Hello guys and welcome back to a new Bible teaching session with Edouard Seleduc. Today I would like to talk about the believer's spiritual authority. And I will begin with explaining a few things about the spiritual realms. There are three realms in which believers are involved. Number one, the physical, visible and earthly realm or the first heaven. The world governments, political structures, all systems and cultures belong to this realm. Number two, the spiritual, invisible and demonic realm or the second heaven. Here we have demonic spiritual authorities that are behind the authority structures, cultures and systems of the earth. They have authority and over and influence the physical realm. This does not mean that we have to become super aware of the devil and believe that there is a demon under every rock. And third, the spiritual invisible and godly realm or the third heaven. Here is the throne of God along with all the angels and the angelic hierarchy structures. Now, what is the correct approach when it comes to spiritual warfare? When talking about spiritual warfare and spiritual authority, many Christians say that we need to know the spiritual principalities we are dealing with and the ranks in the demonic world, meaning the demons of lesser power and authority or demons of greater authority. They say you must know your enemy well before engaging in spiritual warfare. And all of us probably have examples of people making strange intercessions for cities involving all kinds of material symbols like swords uh, and all, all kinds of things. These people start their teaching from the premise of knowing your adversary and focus heavily on the demonic world. But this is the wrong approach for born again Christians. Let's, let me tell you why. Yes, you should know your enemy, but before that, we, you need to know three things. Who you really are in Christ, to whom you belong, and what you possess or what you have. The true spiritual battle of the believer is thought between the two years. That is in the mind, not directly with demonic spiritual forces. Yes, you must know your opponent, but only in relation to these three things you must, that you must know and assimilate as your normal reality deep in your heart. Any teaching about authority and spiritual warfare must begin with these three concepts and their assimilation at the level of the subconscious mind. Let's read Ephesians 6 verse 12 where it says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Here, the Apostle Paul speaks in detail about the demonic principalities and hierarchies. But let us notice in which chapter of the book of Ephesians this verse is found. It's in chapter 6 of the book, which is the last chapter of Ephesians. In verse 10 of the same chapter, Paul uses the expression, Finally, brothers, or furthermore, brothers, this is not the first thing Paul teaches the Ephesians about spiritual warfare. Let's also read Ephesians 1, 19 verse to 23 to see where Paul begins his discussion of authority and spiritual warfare. Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 23. And one is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
as you can see, Paul begins in Ephesians chapter 1 by talking about the boundless greatness of God's power that raised Christ and placed him at the right hand of God's power, giving him a rank of authority far above any other spiritual authority in the heavenly places. Paul then continues the discussion of spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 2, stating that all that Christ has, that is his sphere of authority, we believers also have. Ephesians, Ephesians 2 verse 6 says this, And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Another extraordinary thing we can see in Ephesians 1 verse 22 is that all things are under the feet of Christ for the church. Christ is made up of Jesus the head and the church his body. It is an indestructible and indivisible unitary whole. Ephesians 5.30 tells us that we are bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. If all things are under the feet of Christ and the church is his body, what does this mean for us believers? It means that all things are also under our feet. So Paul begins in Ephesians chapters 1 and 2 to describe the authority and power of Christ and us, the church, and then in chapter 3, verse 10, he describes the purpose of this conferment of authority, that of ruling over the second realm. Ephesians 3, 10 says this, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, meaning from the second realm, likewise, 1 John 3, 8 describes the purpose of Christ's manifestation in us, that of destroying the works of the evil one. 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Only at the end of the book of Ephesians does Paul introduce the believers to the subject of spiritual warfare. So what we need to know is who we are, who we belong to, and what we have. Only when you know these things and live permanently with this awareness, meaning that you don't struggle to convince yourself anymore, that's when you can start talking about spiritual warfare. The third thing I want to touch on in this message is the heavenly places. What are these heavenly places in terms of location? Notice that it is not the heavenly place or God's heaven, but the heavenly places. We have already seen in Ephesians 6.12 that demonic spirits are also in the heavenly places. But now these spirits along with the devil were cast down to earth in Ezekiel 28 verse 17. We see that Isaiah 14.2, Luke 10 verse 18. If the devil is also on earth and in the heavenly places and in the second invisible realm, this means that the earth, together with the second invisible realm, are part of the heavenly places. Then in Ephesians 2, 6, we see that we also have the same rank of authority as Christ in the heavenly places now, but we are located on earth and not with the throne of God in the third realm. This is further evidence that the earth is part of the heavenly places. But according to Ephesians 1.20, it seems that God's heaven or the third spiritual realm is also in the heavenly places. In Isaiah 66 verse 1 and Acts 7.49, we see that heaven or the third heaven is God's throne and the earth is his footstool, which is another indication that the third heaven and the earth are somehow together. Let's read Isaiah 66 verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? Putting Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 23 and 2 verse 6 with 6 verse 12 together, we can conclude that the heavenly places include all three realms. The heavenly places represent all that is around us visible and invisible. And in that common space or dimension, everything is under our feet, under our command in Christ. In terms of authority and rank, God's heaven is the highest, followed by the demonic realm, 
and then the earthly realm. For example, in the building of a business company, which would represent the heavenly places, let's put it this way, the CEO of the company and the cleaning person may be geographically located in the same building, but their ranks of authority differ significantly. All these three realms are interconnected. They intertwine and occupy the same space. When Ephesians chapter 1 verse 21 says far above, it is not referring to the physical location of God's heaven, the third heaven, but to the level of authority. Now let's discuss about symptoms, sources, and solutions. If we look at the physical realm, we see many problems and works of darkness, disease, violence, wars, abortions, rapes, organ trafficking, drug trafficking, and all kinds of evil. But these are just symptoms. The root of these problems lies in the second realm. And only the third realm has the permanent solution to these problems. So what we have here is a third realm with symptomatic problems whose source is in the second realm and whose solution comes from the third realm. You can't treat a first round problem with a first round solution. This is how medicine, med the medical world works, for example. If you have cancer and you try to treat it with medicine, that's okay. It's perfectly fine, but it's a first round remedy. And behind that cancer may be the spirit of infirmity or death, which is a spiritual thing. We are not against doctors because they are after the same thing, after health and healing for us. But they are limited in their ability to help. They try to treat the symptoms which may return. If you learn to operate from the third realm and demolish the problem from the second realm, then the symptoms from the first realm disappear. Let's go further and talk about Jesus' exaltation to authority. All the demonic principalities, authorities, powers, and dominions in the second realms, realm were created by God originally, and all these ranks of authority are a good thing. Likewise, they exist in the angelic world. Colossians 1 verses 15 to 18 says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, meaning by Jesus or by the word, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, the first realm and the other two realms. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. The difference between these authorities or power structures in the second realm and the third realm is that those in the second realm live in rebellion, as we see in Ephesians 6 verse 12. There are principalities, authorities, uh, and powers and might in the third realm as well. But all were created by him and are under him and for him. And he is the head of the church. Wherever the head is, there is my body as well, right? We don't have our head in America and our body in Europe. If he, Jesus, has the greatest fear of authority and he is the head and we are the body, what does that mean? It means that we also have the same sphere of authority. In terms of sphere and rank of authority, we are together in the same place with him. Let's read Philippians 2 verses 6 to 11, where it says this, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of, of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those of, on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Philippians, Philippians 2 verse 9 says that God exalted Jesus because of his humility and suffering, God did not exalt him as God because Jesus was already exalted as God. But he exalted him and lifted him as a man. God cannot be exalted any higher than he already is. Jesus became not only our substitute but also our representative as humanity. What is the difference? Everything he did as a man, he did not only for us and in our place, but also as us. That is representative of the human race. Jesus is one of us. He's of our human race. For example, when you are abroad and you come across someone from your own people and country, aren't you happy? Why? Because you speak the same language, you feel comfortable that he, under, he or she understands you, and he is of the same culture and personality as you. Jesus is the first man, he's one of us, who was brought into unity with God, union with God. We are used to seeing Jesus as God more than we are used to see him as a man. He is first and foremost a human being like us. We need to discipline our minds to see Jesus as a human being because then our whole life will be revolutionized. It is not for nothing that Jesus was called Son of Man in addition to being called Son of God. Jesus was a son of the human race. God has exalted the name of a human being above all other names. The authority of the name of Jesus makes every knee bow in reverence. All beings in all three realms will one day bow before him. Another interesting thing is that Jesus did not exist before the incarnation. From the beginning and throughout the Old Testament, the Trinity was composed of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. John 1 verses 1 to 4 and 14 says this in 1 John 5, 7. Let's read the first passage. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And 1 John 5, 7 says this, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. All that God has done for Jesus and bestowed upon him reveals his heart for humanity. Romans 8 verse 17 says that we have become heirs of God himself and joined heirs with Jesus. All heaven and universe know the name of the human being Jesus. Hebrews 2 verses 5 to 9 says this, For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him after the fall. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sums to glory. And here it doesn't refer to the future glory, but present glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. 
You don't have to worry that it is disrespectful or that you're messing with Jesus if you call him your big brother. He first called us his brothers and sisters. God created Adam to rule over and subdue the physical realm. He put all things under his feet, but he fell. So he who was to subdue all physical things was himself subject, subjected. Jesus is a man, on the other hand, and will be a man for eternity. He kept his physical body of glory, and he is not only a spirit now with God. Jesus has the highest seat of authority as a man over all three realms, physical, demonic, and heavenly. There is nothing extraordinary about God having authority over the three realms because he is God. But for a man, one of ours, to have this authority is something else entirely. Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20 says this, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, yo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus has all authority not only on earth, but also in heaven. And this authority has been given unto him, conferred to him. But no one gives authority to God if the passage refers to Jesus as God. Otherwise, there would have to be someone greater than God, the Father, to give authority to Jesus as God. This authority was given to him as man. You and I have been exalted to an authority far above that which Adam had before the fall. Adam did not have God's eternal life, the Greek zoe. That life was in the tree of life, but we now have it in our born-again spirit. This eternal life is not just endless existence after physical death. It includes endless existence, but that is the secondary part. Eternal life is primarily the life and nature of God himself from the realm of eternity manifested in our spirit here on earth. In the Old Testament, the hierarchy of authority was God, the devil, and their man. In the New Testament, it is God, Jesus and the church together, they, they form the Christ, the devil, and then the rest of the other people. Job, David, Abraham, Elijah, Isaiah were all under the authority of the devil. Now, what does it mean to live or pray in the name of Jesus? It is not a magic formula. It means that everything you are, you do, and speak is in the name of Jesus. You function and live in his name. You can heal and deliver without necessarily mentioning the name of Jesus if when you do it, you are aware in your mind that you are doing it in his name. It is not your words that release the power, that, but the mental awareness you have. In fact, someone said that when demons hear repeated too many times the expression, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, or that someone tries to find the exact formula to say all the right words to cover everything, to make sure they cover everything, then the demons realize that you actually don't really know who you are, or you're not quite sure of who you are. Now, let's say, for example, when Moses was at the burning stake and God told him to throw down the rod, it turned into a snake without God specifically commanding the rod, Rod, I command you to become a snake. The rod turned into a snake only by the mental intention of God, because he's God after all, right? Then in Mark 11, when Jesus got hungry and came looking for something to eat from a fig tree, the Bible says that he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then Jesus answered something to the fig tree and cursed it. This means that the fig tree spoke something to Jesus before Jesus answered. Why was Jesus angry with the fig tree since it was not the fig season? Because Jesus had intended in his mind to find fruit in it even though it was not the fig season. 
From afar, by his intention and expectation, Jesus commanded the fig tree to produce instant figs. But the fig tree stubbornly told him that it was not going to give him any things. Why? Because it was not their time. This is how the things in our life speak to us. They are speaking to us from a human perspective, a normal perspective from the, for the common man. But Jesus had authority over the fig tree at all times. Therefore, he answered it angrily and cursed it. Now, let's take the illustration of a power of attorney. When someone gives you a power of attorney to make decisions on that person's behalf about some accounts or uh, at the bank and represent them at the bank, no one is analyzing you to see what kind of person you are and whether you have the right or the trust, the right attitude and appearance to make those decisions. The bank will only look at the power of attorney to see if it's valid, if it's good uh, and valid. It doesn't matter who you are as a person. In the same way, Jesus gave us his name as a power of attorney. He sent us in his name to make decisions and deliver people from the works of darkness. Therefore, go. We have the mission to go from the perspective of the authority that Jesus as a man and us have. Paul says that we will judge the angels. Now we know why angels are ministering spirits to us. We see that in Hebrews 1.14. They are at your service and mine. Now we can understand a little why they long to look into the gospel and understand why we have such authority. What exactly have we inherited to have such authority when the devil desired such thing and didn't get it? But that, that very authority God willingly gave to man. Hallelujah. This is exactly what bothers the devil enormously and burns him to the core. Hebrews 1.14 says this, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? On my next point, I would like to teach about demons and our authority. The Greek word for authority is exousia. John chapter 1 verses 12 to 13 says that God has also given us the authority to become sons and daughters of God. John 1, 12 to 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In most English translations, the term children of God is used instead of sons of God, which is neither the most correct nor preferable translation. Why? Because the word children makes us think of helpless babies who are always in need of God. God the Father, doing everything for them. And that was true in the Old Testament, but is no longer true in the New Testament. This is not the reality of what this verse wants to convey. The more correct term that is also used by the King James Version translation is sons or daughters, since the Greek word used here for sons or children is technon, which means born of God and having the same nature as him. The other Greek terms for babies would be brephos or nepios. We are the legal heirs of God himself and of all that he has. Because of this, we have authority. If we do not understand that we are born of the word, 1 Peter 1 verse 23, exactly like Jesus, we cannot even begin the spiritual warfare or any deliverance. We see before the resurrection how Jesus gave the disciples authority to do something. Let's see together what they could do with the authority they had. Not because they were born of God as we are now, but because Jesus conferred temporarily his authority to this man. Matthew 10 verse 1 says this, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Look what they could do with this authority that was only temporarily vested in them. Cast out every unclean spirit and heal any disease and any disability or infirmity. 
How can sickness ever come near you, you who have the ultimate authority as a son or daughter of God? You have the authority of the authorities. Luke 10, 19 says this, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Snakes and scorpions hide. They stay out of sight. They are subtle. Behind every problem in the material world, there is a demonic spiritual force lurking and we with God given authority can step over even these lurking forces as well. Notice one more thing. The authority Jesus gave the disciples was over all the power of the enemy. This means that the devil along with all his demons were under the command of the disciples and impl implicitly ours. We in Christ have authority over all the power of the enemy. The power of the enemy is at our command, under our authority. What exactly does this mean? Let me give you an example. In a war, maybe some soldiers don't want to go to the battle. But because they are under the authority of their president of that country, they have no choice but to go and must obey. Or, for example, a huge bulldozer represents massive raw power that can easily destroy cement walls. But if a policeman waves the bulldozer driver to stop, he must obey. In other words, this machine that has such great power stops before the authority above it. Power, or the Greek dunamis, is under the command of authority, the Greek exousia. Believers in Christ have received both the supreme authority as sons of God and the supreme power, meaning the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about the importance of being yourself under, the, under authority. Let's read Matthew 8 verses 5 to 13. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. And he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. The great faith of the Roman centurion is only the result of a great revelation. And what is the great revelation this centurion had? The revelation of authority. His faith was the result of his revelation of authority. Look at what the centurion says. Say just one word. You must not move even a muscle and my servant will, will be healed, not may be healed. This centurion was a Gentile and Jesus was impressed by his level of faith which was nothing more than a consciousness of authority. And the centurion explains his revelation. He says, For I am a man under authority. He was under the authority of Caesar, who was in Rome, and the centurion lived in Capernaum. He was a centurion, which meant he had a hundred men under him. But he himself was under Caesar's authority as well. What gave him authority over the hundred soldiers was the greater authority under which he himself was. 
For you to have authority, you in turn must be under an authority or put yourself under an authority. That is the authority of Christ. Your authority has power and value only if you are, if you are under a greater authority. Those under your authority fear the authority above you. In other words, the centurion recognized and admitted that Jesus was operating under the authority of God himself. And his servant was healed at that time. In the spiritual world, there is no distance or space. A demon from the other end of the earth will hear a word of command from you. Many times we hear of some great man of God and we want him or her so much to come into our house and lay his hands on some sick person to be healed. We want that man to be close in the geographical proximity of our problem that needs solving, such as a physical illness. And we even say in our thoughts, if only this man would come to my house, everything would be solved. But this is not great faith. It's not geographic proximity that makes things work. Then we see another interesting thing. When Jesus gave the command to heal the centurion's servant, he did not use an exact formula or an elaborate command. Look at what he said. He didn't foam at the mouth, get agitated, or repeat himself. He just simply said, Go, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. How much we have to learn from Jesus. Isn't that right? You can even come close to someone who is sick. And if your intention is to heal him or her, you can just lay your hand on him without saying anything and she should be healed. That's what Jesus did as well. And we see that in Luke 430, 4.40. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. It doesn't say anything about speaking. Matthew 8 verse 16. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. We are at the last point now of my message, which is the importance of the seat of power and jurisdiction. Luke 10 verse 1 says this, After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two, before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Christ's authority has been transferred to us and he has sent us as disciples to declare things in his place and to command things in his place. In the New Testament, God does not move mountains for us. Did you know that? Nowhere in the New Testament are we told that God moves mountains for us, but we move them using the authority conferred. Now, the way to pray has changed in the New Testament. There are two things to understand about authority, about exousia. One, the source of power or the seat of power, and second, the jurisdiction of authority the sphere of influence or over whom you can exercise your authority. A security guard, for instance, cannot stop your car on the street and check the car's documents because he has no jurisdiction over road traffic. Only the traffic police has jurisdiction there, right? When you try to use your authority, you may encounter resistance at times. So you also need strength or power to crush the enemy's power. And we have both. And our authority in Christ has jurisdiction over all heavenly places and over all realms. When the disciples were sent out to preach and heal people, Jesus was somewhere else probably and perhaps sleeping. But wherever the disciples were alone and without Jesus himself, the authority conferred on them still worked. The disciples probably began to think that it had something to do with them, although it didn't. But it was only the authority conferred. And when they returned, and to, returned enthusiastically, Jesus told them, 
Rejoice not that the demons obey you, but that your names are written in heaven. That is, you have the same authority as I do in the heavenly places. Our minds must be focused on this authority. What is the source of our power or the seed of power? God the Father through the Holy Spirit. What is the source of our authority? Jesus Christ. What is the jurisdiction of our authority? All heavenly places. I hope, I really hope you've been blessed by this message and that it increased your confidence in the spiritual authority you have. May God continue to bless you and cause you to walk in favor in all your ways. Amen.